Hello, it's Mr. Turek. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, Unit 7, which deals with abstract or contemporary subject matter. Um, I'm still going to follow kind of the traditional hierarchy of genres, even though in contemporary painting today that doesn't really hold true. It's still reacted to and still referred to at times. Here are your choices. Uh, for this unit, you'll notice that there's a different range of choices for different paintings here. Um, I think the only uh, uh, style of painting I don't have a lot of choices for is genre paintings or um, contemporary everyday life paintings. Uh, this is kind of a difficult genre to really define well in painting. Um, but take a look at these and uh, I'm not too open to uh, other suggestions in these categories as I was with the traditional unit, unit 6, uh, only because there's so many options in each of these projects. Um, if you're interested at all in any of them after I describe each project in category, uh, please check out the PowerPoint because these are just chock full with just hundreds of and hundreds of examples of what you can do for each project. So uh, yeah, try to keep your mind really open and really explore these if you're interested in any of them. Um, before we start, I, I do want to clarify the language again of kind of what I mean by abstract or contemporary or modern. Um, abstract or abstraction or anything I refer to as abstract is just basically what that means. Uh, if I can put it in kind of uh, the simplest terms possible. And sometimes I'm not very good at this, so, you know, really look up the term and sort of do your own research if I'm not making sense. Um, basically what it means is a, it's, a, it's a process or a way of deriving ideas from actual literal ideas or concepts. So if you're making something abstract, you're taking the core reality of what that is and you're just sort of giving us a broad blanket idea of what that is. So, you know, if you if you try to describe or depict a soccer ball, you know, there's other concrete things about that that make it a soccer ball. So, you know, it has black and white alternating octagonal and hexagonal shapes uh, or pentagon and hexagon shapes. It, it, it's a sphere. Uh, it, um, you know, is used in the sport of football, soccer. Uh, so, um, you know, in attempting to describe that, you know, there's you can abstract it to those simpler concepts um, and still refer to or call back to or represent what a soccer ball is without it actually being a soccer ball. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I mean by when I mean abstract. And even though some of the stuff you're going to see in here won't really fit into the traditional you know, forms of abstraction, it, it doesn't really matter. It, the, the fact that it doesn't conform to reality sometimes makes it abstract, or it will be contemporary. And uh, contemporary just simply means it's, it's uh, contemporary art is art that is being made in the here and now. Uh, any living artist is considered contemporary artist. Any art they make is considered contemporary art. Um, and their art is typically shown in galleries, not museums. Now, there are museums dedicated to contemporary art. Uh, Chicago has a museum dedicated to one. Most major cities do. But uh, their, their exhibitions are, are rarely ever permanent. They, they contain sometimes art made by living artists, but, you know, that's very selectively chosen. Or, you know, it's, it's not very selectively chosen, and there's just an abundance of it. Uh, we don't really know what will stand the test of time, what will be what we look to when we consider our life and times in this era right now. So, you know, contemporary art is kind of a, a wide open field. Um, I will also use the word uh, modern. Now, uh, colloquially used, modern will mean everyday. So modern as in contemporary times or everyday times or the time we live in now. And that's just kind of a colloquial means slang. So if I say modern in certain contexts, it may mean just, you know, everyday, today. Uh, but modernism, or modern as a movement, art movement, refers to the late 19th and early 20th century. Sometimes I refer to some art as modern art, and that may not mean it's contemporary art. It may mean it's modern aid in, you know, like the 40s and 50s or, you know, even earlier. So, um, you know, uh, some of the abstract art you've seen up to this point may be considered modern art. Some certain artists may be, 
considered modern artists, not contemporary artists. Um, and that distinction is kind of important. Um, I know I'm probably going to confuse you by using modern colloquially and, you know, literally as a, an art term, but uh, you, you ought to be able to sort it out once you kind of get a feel for both words and their uses and their contexts. And then, uh, yeah, we should be clear on language. Um, the main objective of this unit is to create abstract art. Art that is derived from uh, your reality or how you see the world or concepts in the world or concrete things. Um, the fact that it's abstract, though, does not mean it's uh, sui generis or ex nihilo, in, uh, sui generis Latin for uh, of its own kind or of its own uh, genre. And uh, ex nihilo stands from out of nothing. So it's not original art. It's not art that comes from nowhere or nothing. Uh, that would be wholly original or only for you or to you or of you. Um, abstract art is, is has some foundation in reality or a, a concrete concept. Um, if you're just making stuff just to make stuff and just to make stuff for yourself, it, it would probably be considered folk art. Um, you know, you can let your personal viewpoint enter into it. You can obviously use your own style or make some individual choices that are your choices or your, you know, like you have a lot of freedom, but that doesn't mean that you're, you're not really referring to anything or that you get to get away with everything. You know, I mean, it, abstract art has its foundation, has its own tradition, has uh, concerns and it concerns itself with reality and especially in this academic setting you're you're it's expected of you to refer to some kind of process um, I'm gonna recommend and require of you in a lot of these projects that you make a lot of sketches that you really plan it out and that you do your visual research before you start a painting mainly because I wanna avoid art that's ignorant and poorly made um, yes, you can be kind of loose with your technical skills when you make abstract art. Like, you don't have to be super realistic all the time. But that does not mean that you completely abandon everything you know and can do to just sort of, you know, fart out a painting, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, it, I see a lot of kids sort of make fun of art that's abstract, and I see a lot of students uh, make fun of the whole concept of art because it's abstract or conceptual. And most of the time when those artists are making those decisions to make that kind of art that is hard to understand or, or very abstract, uh, they do it because there's some sometimes some pretty deep reasons. Uh, yeah, they're, they're sometimes they're being funny or you know trying to add humor to it, but often, you know, the humor is lost on most people. And that's because you just don't understand the tradition or the means by which that artist achieves that. Um, so this unit is going to familiarize you with that. And uh, if you know you get frustrated with my interpretation of things versus your interpretation of things, just realize I've been alive longer. I've seen a lot more abstract art. I've, I've studied abstract art and art in general. And that I, I kind of know what I'm looking for and I want to push you academically. I'm trying to push you um, and educate you in an academic setting. Um, talk to me before you, you make something in this unit. Uh, don't just assume you know everything, because chances are, you know, if you do make something and then call it abstract, you know, no one's going to pay attention to you because you're really not, you know, paying attention to them and their concerns and their traditions and the things they know. Um, if you ignore your audience when you make abstract art, you really kind of dig yourself into a hole. Um, so really think about what you do before you do it when you're making this style, making this kind of art. Um, let's get into the projects. Your first project here, uh, I call the Modern Day Still Life, or you know, Modern Still Life for short. Um, and again, it's it's a still life that's uh, kind of concerned with things, objects in you know contemporary life, and it may have an unusual setting or a different kind of style. If you take a look at this uh, presentation, there's a like a bunch of slides in it and there's a ton of different styles you can do. There's a ton of different, um, 
you know, like ways to arrange your objects, but, you know, I, I highly recommend you use objects that are of this day, of this era, and, and just sort of have fun with this. Um, the picture in the right here is a Thai bowl, um, famous uh, still life artist, and, you know, his style and his subject matter very contemporary, very of this day and era. You know, just take a look at that PowerPoint if you're ever interested in, in making a still life that, that has a little bit more pizzazz to it. Um, the Animal Portrait Project is extremely expansive. Uh, I just call it animal design. And I actually refer to traditional animal portraiture in this project. Uh, part of the reason for that is because it's still a valid form of art making in the here and now. Uh, you still see people doing animal portraits in the traditional way. You still see people doing, you know, like, uh, you know, animal portraits for deceased pets. It's, it's something I've done for money at certain points in time in my life. I still would do them if anybody would pay me. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of options in this project, uh, just a lot of different styles. I kind of walk you through a bunch of different styles and sort of give you free reign to pick which one you want to do. Um, so please explore this if you're love if you love animals and you love painting animals uh, take a look at all the different things you can do with this particular project all right this this set of projects is kind of one of my favorites um, and I'm not too interested in landscapes uh, this it just happened to turn out that this project was extremely interesting when I got it uh, going um, the first option is man versus nature. So these are artists that are concerned with man's um, place in nature. So it calls back to actually the romantic era of art, which was actually kind of early um, in sort of like the development of, you know, kind of contemporary concerns with painting. And it, it is actually a very old era. So very old paintings, but uh, still, still kind of a new idea, that, that idea that man has his place in nature. He doesn't dominate nature. Nature dominates him. And then, uh, you know, in this project, if you take a look at the project slides or the uh, artist examples in the slide presentation, uh, um, there's just a, a ton of them. I mean, lots of different artists make work that relates to man and nature. Um, so just take a look at that if you're really interested in that whole dichotomy and the idea that, you know, we're not the only and most important things on this planet. Um, the second option is actually uh, adapted from a drawing project, but uh, um, it still holds true as a, something you should know how to do and, and uh, something I would really love to see happen. It's called a perspective improvisation painting, and basically what I require you to do is, is draw about 30 or so objects in perspective and then just sort of have fun improvising with perspective and, and three-dimensional objects and sort of the deception involved in that. Um, if you take a look at this presentation, there are just hundreds of artists that still use perspective as a means to convey space. And so, you know, it's not a very realistic sense of space, like the example in the middle here. You know, very, very colorful and neon and pretty, but, you know, it, it still looks like it's a giant neon city. You know, it, it has that sense of space and it has that it lacks that sense of realism so you know you can have a lot of fun with this and a lot of fun making sort of this abstract yet realistic looking uh, sort of you know I don't know if you want to make a city or what but uh, take a look at that if you're if you're interested in perspective and making things in perspective um, your last option is the urban landscape painting uh, kind of speaks for itself basically instead of doing a landscape of nature or one that's invented, like the perspective improvisation painting. You're you're painting uh, today's city. Um, there were landscape paintings back in the day of cities, but they were very rare, and they often depicted cities that were, you know, super important, like Rome or you know London. They didn't depict, uh, you know, your everyday metropolitan area. And so a lot of artists are kind of enamored with the modern day city and, and things in the city like graffiti or you know people in the city uh, so take a look at this if you kind of want to you know depict Freeport or, or uh, another city of yours that's your favorite Chicago whatever um, 
take a look at this because uh, this has actually got a lot of cool artists in it as well that sort of they take a very realistic approach but uh that's kind of what you're doing with this uh, a traditional landscape painting of a non-traditional subject but um, these are these are all your options for current land or these are currently what's uh considered landscape painting um so take a look at these there's, there's a lot of really cool artists in this uh, project group um, for this one, this is, I just call it the modern situations or modern day situations uh, painting. Uh, this is kind of meant to take the place of genre painting. And uh, a genre painting, again, if you looked at the first hierarchy unit, uh, unit six, genre painting was paintings concerned with everyday life and events and scenes in everyday life. Um, there are artists that are concerned with the quotidian, the everyday quotidian is a fancy word for every day um, uh, you know and they they kind of take a pretty dreamlike surreal approach to it of course you know the, the painting in here is an Eric Fischel painting uh, called the barbecue I believe um, and it's just super weird you got two women uh, swimming in the pool completely nude and then the boy of course you know shooting fire from his mouth and some fish and then the dad's grilling I mean you know it could be said to be kind of like a dream almost I, I, and this painting is kind of where you know genre painting or everyday painting is today I mean there's so much of everyday that we've kind of gone past uh, the typical genre painting um, but take a look at this if you're interested in sort of that sort of a uh, I don't know, elusive everyday situation that you find yourself in and kind of the surreality of that. Um, this, this, this is for you if you really like kind of dreamy or sort of weird imagery, but it doesn't quite lose its realism. You know, uh, kind, of, kind of a weird thing to be concerned with, but the artists that are concerned with this are uh, still, still pretty important, still pretty uh, vital. Um, so yeah. This is by far one of uh, my favorite project groups. This is the one I usually pressure students to push themselves in the most. This is the one I like to see students do. And the reason for that is because this is what I like to do. Um, I, like to, I like to paint and draw portraits. And I, you know, I would probably do some of this stuff if I wasn't so concerned with my particular style of painting and its concerns, which I don't know what category my painting falls under, but you know, I, I did start out in portraiture. So there's there's three options for this, and they're all really really expansive options. Um, your first option is I just call face abstraction, and then I give you two main styles to look at. Now the first style of cute is cubism. And I kind of go through the, you know, examples of cubism, starting with Picasso and his, you know, sort of, he sort of started to abstract the human form. He was the father of that. He started to do that. Um, and I'm not going to get into the history of cubism, but if you look it up, it, it, you'll find tons of information on that. And then the other style I give you to kind of look at or consider is pop surrealism. Um, there is surreal surrealism, uh, you know, the, the first movement of that, but the reason I, I talk about pop or neo-surrealism uh, is because it's being made today. And uh, a lot of these artists you've probably seen or would like, and they are very popular, very poppy. Uh, bright, fancy colors, really, you know, sexy kind of, you know, contemporary subjects. Um, a lot of kind of just cartoony, almost like anime-related imagery. Um, so take a look at that if you're kind of considering doing portraiture in that sort of style. Um, the second option I call the warped reference. And uh, I also have a tutorial for uh, warping references or reference materials. So I basically walk you through a bunch of steps in Photoshop you can take to completely or drastically warp your reference material. And um, you know, you can, you can take a look at that tutorial, you can take a look at the examples I give you of artists that do this, and then you can just kind of use that warp reference as the foundation for your painting, and and that'll kind of help you abstract the portrait um, without having to do kind of the intellectual heavy lifting of you know kind of making up your own uh, abstract thing. 
Um, so this is kind of for people who, who feel like, oh, I'm super realist. I don't know how to be creative. Uh, well, this this will help you be creative. This will kind of give you a crutch to lean on. Um, so something you might want to try. And then the last option here is by far the uh, longest option. Uh, portraiture has not died, and uh, figurative artwork has not died. For a while there, when you know um, geometric and expressive abstraction was coming to the fore, people stopped painting people. Uh, artists just weren't concerned with the human figure. It had been done so many times over and over again. So they just sort of kind of abandoned it or let it die, but it didn't really die. Uh, artists continued to paint portraits and figures and nudes and such. And uh, today we're left with uh, just, I mean, I couldn't, I can't possibly give you the scope of artwork being made in this particular genre right now. I mean, there's just so many artists who paint people, it's almost impossible to collect them all. So the the project, the new way to do portraits is what I call it has, I mean, I categorize a bunch of different styles and it just has tons and tons of examples of portrait artists or people who paint people or, or depict the figure, the human figure. And uh, just take a look at that because, uh, you know, if you don't think you can do a portrait realistic, well, yeah, the chances are you, you, you can probably do it in sort of a abstract style and, and have a lot of fun doing it. Um, so really, really take a look at um, these examples, these artists, because there's just a bunch of them. And it's a really, really cool, I think at least, a, a really cool project. Uh, your last option here, I just kind of call loosely the new painting genres. Um, this is the last genre where history painting would be. Obviously, um, you know, these two projects can't possibly encompass all of the kinds and styles and concerns of painting in today's world, in today's art world. Uh, but I kind of try to loosely put some categories around some major concerns. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you have some other ideas as to what you would like to do for this, uh, shoot them at me. Um, but uh, your, last, your, your last few options here, the first option, pretty straightforward, um, I call it an altered history painting. And any, really what it means is you can take any historical or art historical work done by a master and alter that painting some way. Here we have in the example on the left, uh, Vasquez, a uh, painting of the Pope, a famous painting of the Pope he did, uh, that has a Pinocchio mask over it, so that's, that's a painting that's you know, referencing an old master's work and, and sort of altering it. That's kind of what that project is. You would take a masterpiece and paint it again, but paint it differently or paint it with some kind of humorous, you know, change or omission or, I don't know, add something silly or fun to it, I guess. Um, that, that would be that project. And then the last project is just called abstract language or, or sometimes I'll call it abstract abstract shape language. Uh, a lot of artists do geometric abstraction now, and they have, you know, their own visual language for what they make. Um, and, you know, the example here is uh, Julie Mavaretu, and uh, she she's a wonderful abstract artist. I love her work, just so many shapes. Um, but if you take a look at this project, I mean, there's uh, there's just tons and tons of examples of artists who paint abstractly using only shape and color and, and sort of the formal concerns behind those, like making a balanced composition. A lot of these artists I would consider, um, unlike the previous geometric abstraction you've seen, uh, I would consider these guys, instead of minimalist, they're more maximalist. They're more like Julie's work. Uh, she, she has a ton of shapes, a ton of lines, a ton of things to balance, and, and a lot of the examples in this abstract shape language project are examples of artists who just have tons and tons of details and works and just, just tons of stuff going on. So like, uh, take a look at this. If you like abstraction, if you think that's your thing, you know, uh, try to think in terms of instead of like simplification, maybe go all out. Uh, make as many shapes and colors as you can um, and do it with purpose, you know. 
make a make a certain shape over and over again. Obviously, if you look at this Julie Met Red who work, you know she's using some of the same shapes again and again, or she's using multiple lines and, and multiple marks to kind of convey movement. Um, so yeah, take a look at that um, if you're interested. Uh, that kind of concludes this unit in the class for the most part. Um, I'm a little less open to con considering other projects for this unit only because these projects are so open. So really, really, really explore this unit before you come up to me with a with a suggestion as to something that's outside of the limits of these projects. Know exactly which project you're doing before you do it. And then when you're doing it, if I don't already mention in the project criteria or you didn't read the project criteria, um, know that I'm probably going to expect you to make quite a few sketches and, and sort of do some visual research before you start your painting. Uh, the only reason I say that is because uh, these paintings are kind of, you know, intellectually, they, they require a lot more of you than just sort of like making stuff up. I mean, I know it seems like these artists just sort of sit down and paint whatever they feel like, but, you know, they have a, they have a visual language. They, they draw, they, they practice, they sort of explore images and shapes and things in the real world before they make these paintings. Um, so you kind of have to follow that process if you're going to make work like they are. Um, so yeah, last unit, and uh, hope you enjoyed painting.